Well, turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. You know, we're continuing to our study of Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. He's in prison in Rome. They under, he, he, he had gone through on the second missionary journey, led the people to Christ in Philippi, started the church. He left. They actually sent things to him more than once. He's now in prison in Rome. It's been a long time since he's actually been to Philippi. And, and they found out he's in prison in Rome. They sent a guy named Epaphroditus. He comes and he brings the gift. And so Paul writes the letter to not only tell them to stand strong and a fallen world, but to thank them for the gift. And as you know, as we've been going verse by verse through the book, we've now reached the last part of the letter, and in the last part of the letter, Paul talks about giving. He talks about the fact that they gave. He said, I rejoice that you've given. Nevertheless, you've done well. He talked about how you've given more than once. You gave it Thessalonica. I've received it all. So he's just a lot, a lot of great things. So when we, as we look at this letter, Paul is dealing with the gifts, and, and, and we're also not only going to talk about the gifts, we're going to talk about the truth about giving. We're going to look at that a little bit this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about biblical giving. Giving is good. In fact, we saw last week that giving benefits the giver and the receiver. That when you give, not only are the, you benefit the person you give to, but you benefit it as well. And we're going to look at that. We're going to do something a little different since we don't have a lot of time. I'm going to teach you through our passage, and then we're going to take something and go very quickly through some ideas about biblical principles of biblical truths. So let me start with this, and let me just say about some misconceptions about about these areas right here. Misconceptions about salvation, about the church as a building, and the church wants money. The truth is this, a lot of people are confused about salvation. They'll say it's grace, but they actually add works to it. We know that salvation is a gift. Jesus Christ died and rose again. Whoever believes in him will never perish, but have the gift of eternal life. It is not our works, our goodness, what we do, what we keep doing. It is simply faith alone and Christ alone for eternal life. There's a lot of misconceptions because people say, well, it's faith plus this, or you got to believe and then you got to do this. We know that salvation is by faith alone and Christ alone. The second thing is that there's a misconception about the church. A lot of people think that the building is the church. They'll say something like, hey, JB, where is your church? I know what they mean. They mean, where is the building your church meets in? Because the church is the body of Christ. The third thing is that uh, some people say church just wants your money. Every time you go, they talk about money. So if you're here for the first time today, guess what we're talking about? Money. But anyway, that's the bottom line. We, we, we don't uh, the, the church as a whole doesn't want people's money. What they want is the believer to understand, believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life, and then become a disciple and make an impact for Jesus Christ. So uh, let me, as we get started, I'm, I thought I'd do something a little bit different this morning. I thought there are many misconceptions about giving. So I'm going to put some up, let you think about them with me, okay? Here's some misconceptions. That you're to give 10%, that you're to make a pledge to God, that you owe God a particular part. Like somebody say, you owe God. You owe God 10%. You owe God this. And, and, you know, and, and that money itself is evil. Or that you need to tell people what to give or they won't give. Or you give so that you will get. Like the person says on the TV, if you'll give to our ministry, God will bless you. So the motive for giving is to get. Well, let me just tell you this. First of all, there's no place in the Old Testament and New Testament for tithing. There is that tithing aspect. And under the Mosaic law, there were three tithes, which were three 10% things. So a Jewish person, we'll talk about it more in a little bit, Jewish person would give 20% every year, 30% every three years, and that was called the tithing system. We've never been under a tithing system. Christ is the end of the law to all who believe. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. The second one is pledges. That puts people under vow. We're not asking anybody in this building to pledge anything. We're saying, you think what you might plan to teach, but you're not making a vow to God that you're going to give a certain amount of money. We do not want you to put yourself into some kind of vow system. That's not what we do. The third thing is we owe God. I had a person say, uh, you owe God a certain amount, and if you don't give it, uh, he's going to make you have a flat tire. He's going to make your car break. I said, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. First of all, uh, we don't owe God a part. We owe God everything. Everything we have comes from God. Everything we have comes from God, not a portion of it. Money is evil. No, money, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money itself is not evil. We could do a lot of great things, so to speak, with money. You have to tell people what to give or they won't give. Some people actually believe that. I understand that under grace, when you understand what Jesus Christ has done for you, how he died and rose again for you, gives you eternal life, you're saved and saved forever, you understand about giving. You want to give. I had a friend that was a pastor, and he believed, he understood that tithing was not for today. But he taught his people they had to give 10% because he said, if you don't tell them what to give, they won't give. I don't believe that at all. 
We don't go telling you what to give, and you give amazingly because you give as an act of love, worship, and trust. The last one is you give to get. And as I said, you'll hear people say, give to this ministry and God will bless you. There is a truth that as you give, God blesses you. He who sows sparingly reaps sparingly. He who sows most bountifully reaps bountifully. But that's not your motive. Your motive is an act of worship, love, and trust, which we talked about last week. And so you give not because God's going to bless you. He is going to bless you, but because of your love, worship, and trust. Here's the two things we're going to do, and I'm going to do them pretty quickly. Uh, we're going to look at Philippians 4, 18 through 20, where we're going to talk about where he shows that giving is worship, giving is trusting God, and that God gets all the glory. And then very briefly, and I'm going to go quickly, I might even talk fast in this section right here, but we're going to look at biblical principles of giving, and we're going to see how that works. So let's look at Philippians chapter 4. We could start at verse 18, but I want you to go back to verse 14, because Paul starts this little section by saying, you did really good to give. Notice what he says in verse 14. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. Remember, Paul's in prison. The church at Philippi took up something, whether it was money, food, clothes, whatever, and they sent it to Paul when he's in Rome in prison. And he says, you have done good. You have done well to share with me in my affliction. So it's, it's good to, to do that. Then he says that they are in partnership with him. Notice he says in verse 15, you yourselves also know, Philippians, at the first preaching of the gospel, when I first went there and taught the Bible to you and you you believed in Jesus for eternal life. He says, after I left Macedonia, after I left you, no church shared with me, partnered with me in the manner of giving and receiving, but you alone. He said, you are the ones that were partners with me. And giving is a partnership. Look what he goes on to say in verse 16. He says, for even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. So Paul says, you did good by giving. He says, giving is a partnership, and it really is. That the per and, and we're going to see it, that whenever you give, there's blessing there for you. Whoever you give to, there's blessing there for them. And that's what he says in the next verse. Giving benefits the giver. Now, we all know that giving benefits the, the receiver, like if I said, I got a hundred bucks and I'm going to give it to you, you go, thank you. Okay, you got benefited. But what you don't realize is the person who gives them gives also is blessed. Look what Paul says, verse 17. Not that I seek the gift itself. He said, I got plenty, I'm good. But I seek for the profit which increases to your account. He actually says, giving benefits the giver. God actually says that when you give as, as an act of worship, love, and trust, that God is going to bless you. That it like goes onto your account. And one of these days, you're going to stand before Jesus Christ. And what we want to hear him say is what? Well done, good and faithful servant. So he says, giving benefits the giver. And then giving benefits the receiver. Look what he says in verse 18. But I've received everything in full. Wow. I have abundance. I'm amply supplied. Thank you so much. You gave me everything. He then goes on saying, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. I'm going to stop there for a second. So what he says is, when you gave, you got the blessing. And he says, when you gave, it was to your account that God's going to bless. He says, but when you gave, it also helped me. I've received everything. It's abundant. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. So that's kind of the background, and then here we are. We're going to look at verses 18, 19, and 20. And what we see is that in verse 18, giving is worship. Verse 19, giving tr is trusting God to supply. And then verse 20, God gets all the glory. Look at verse 18. It's an act of worship. I'll read it again. He says, but I received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. And then look how he describes what they sent. A fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. He says it's an act of worship. As we mentioned last time, that when you give, it's an act of worship. This morning, if you give any time here, it's an act of worship. If you send something in the mail, if you say, I'm going to give this much to the building, it's an act of worship. And he says it is a fragrant aroma. It's the worship that's going up to God, an acceptable sacrifice, <coughs> well-pleasing to God. So it's a sacrifice. It's an offering. So when you give, it's an act of worship. We talk about it on Sunday mornings. You've heard me say over and over, we've come to worship our God. And so as we sing, as we pray, as we give, as we study, all are acts of worship. You respond to God. You give. And that's, he's saying giving is an act of worship. But there's more. 
Giving is an act of trust. Look at verse 19. Because when you give away, you could say, if I give away, how am I going to make it? Am I going to have enough if I give away? Look what he says. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He says, it's an act of, that it's an act of trust. You've got to trust God. When you give away, if you had $100 and you gave away 20, you're going to have to trust him that you can make it on 80 bucks. That's what's going to happen. And so what we see in this passage, God is the one who supplies our needs, not our wants, but our needs, according to his riches, all that he has, and he has everything. I want you to notice something. God is the one who supplies everything we have comes from God. A lot of times we say things like, that's my phone, that's my house, that's my car. And the truth is, it is, but it isn't. Because who got that for you? How are you able to get it? Everything you have belongs to God. First Corinthians actually says, what do you have that God didn't give you? The answer is nothing. He gave me everything. So God is the one who supplies. It's our needs. God will supply what we need. Not necessarily our wants. I want you to understand that over my life, many times he's given me my wants. But he supplies all our needs. And then according to his glorious riches. And, and his, he didn't say out of his riches. He said according to his riches. If it was out of his riches and he had a million, he could give you $10. That's out of his riches. But if it's according to his riches, he's a millionaire. He gives it all. So he supplies all our needs. So giving is worship and giving is trust. And then look at the next verse, verse 20. <coughs> giving is glory. It's, God gets all the glory. He says, <coughs> excuse me, and now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God gets all the glory in everything. And so when you think about it, he, he takes care of us. He supplies our needs. It's an act of worship. We trust him. And so when we look at it, giving is worship and trust and glorifies God. And so that's Paul. Now, what, next week, we're actually going to finish verse by verse of the book. We're going to go back and get a little bit on 20, and they get 20, 21, 22, and 23, and we'll finish the book verse by verse, passage by passage. We're still not through because we have to put the book together. We'll do that. But what I want to do, and, I, and, and time is very short, and I talk slow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some principles, okay? I'm going to give them to you, and we'll go through them fairly quickly. Uh, I just want you to see what the Bible tells us about the idea of giving. Because we're in, a, we're in an aspect that we as a body are thinking about, okay, what are we going to give toward the building? Now, we already think and plan what we're going to give on a monthly basis, most likely, or a weekly basis to, to the budget of the church and all that. But what about the building? Well, the first thing I want you to understand, biblical principles, all that we have comes from God. Everything that we have comes from God. In 1 Corinthians 4, 7, he says, what do you have, what do you have that you didn't get from God? The answer is nothing. I, I, everything I have comes from God. So the first concept is everything you have is God's, okay? Here's the second thing, and I want you to see this because most people are confused. We want to understand biblical giving, both Old Testament and New Testament. Now, let me show you something you may have never taught, but realize we're going to have a membership training in just a, really a few minutes. We're going to have a membership training. I'm going to teach something about giving in there. For most people, I will actually say to them, how many of you were taught a certain thing and every hand goes up. I'm going to show you something in just a second that maybe you were taught that maybe today you realize it is not biblical, okay? So I want you to understand Old Testament, New Testament giving. There are two kinds of giving in the Bible. There are required giving, which is what you have to give. It's called tithes. It's not a tithe. Under the Mosaic law, there were three tithes. We'll talk more about it in a second. And then there's what you call free will giving, which is an, an offering, an act of worship. I want you to understand something. Required giving is not worship. Just get that in your head. It's what you have to do. So there was required giving and their free will giving. Let me let you understand something. First of all, this, that we're going to talk about before the Mosaic law from Adam to Moses. We're going to talk about under the Mosaic law, Moses to Christ. And then we're going to talk about after the law, New Testament, after the death of Jesus Christ. Okay, we're going to see this. So let's start with before the law. I want you to understand there was what we call free will offerings or free will giving, acts of worship. During the law or under the Mosaic law, there was free will giving, but there was also required giving called tithes, and they're plural, and there are three of them. And then after the law, guess what? It's called free will giving. So let me, let's just talk quickly. Before the law, 
Giving was an act of worship. It's free will giving, and it's, it's how they did it. Think about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, even those. They came with an offering. They came to worship God. And so from Adam and Eve all the way up to Moses to the nation of Israel coming out of Egypt and getting a law up to that point, all giving were acts of worship. Free will offerings, they were called. Then under the Mosaic law, there were two kinds of giving. There were still the free will giving where you could just give it, but then there was the required, and they were called tithes, and there were three of them. What were they for? When God brought the nation together, gave them the law, he set up a sacrificial system. He took the Levites, the tribe of Levi, and he told them they're going to help with the tabernacle and the temple. They were not given land to live on. And so God said, all the other tribes are going to give 10%, 10%, and 10% to support the priest, the tribes, the tribe of Levi, and the tabernacle, and the temple. And so every year, listen, you you may not realize this. Let me me see if I can get to it there. Uh, You've heard in Malachi where it says, bring your tithes and offerings to the storehouse of the temple. That was for the Jewish people. You're not Jewish. You're not, you're not the nation of Israel. You're the church, which is the body of Christ, which is different. And so the nation of Israel was required to bring what they call tithes, and then there were offerings, which is their free will offerings. Now, tithes, there was a 10% tithe they gave every year. There was another 10% tithe they gave every year. And then every third year, every three years, they gave another 10%. So every year, a Jewish person gave 20%. Every third year, they gave 30%. And and that was required giving. It was not an act of worship. They also had the privilege to give free will offerings. Do you remember the story of the little lady, the little widow who gave the widow's mites, where she had the two little coins that she put in there, and Jesus said, she's given more than everyone else because she gave out of what she had? That was not a tithe. That was an offering. So understand, you're not under a tithe system. You never have been under a tithe system. When I ask, and I will ask, when I ask the people joining, the 30-something people joining in just a little bit, I'm going to ask them, how many of you were taught that you're supposed to give a tenth? You know what's going to happen? Every hand's going to go up because that's what people are taught. You've never been under the Mosaic Law. You've never been under a tithe system. You're under a free will offering system. The tithe system supported the sacrificial system. The free will offerings were an act of worship. Now, what about us today? After, before the law, free will. During the law, free will and required. After the law, free will. We give as we purpose in my heart. We give in a free will way. And you remember uh, the, the, the verse? Let each one do, now this passage is talking about giving because he's talking about giving. He says, so let each one must do, each one must give just as he what? Purposed in his heart. What you decided. It's not grudgingly or under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. So as a person who's not under the Mosaic Law, you've never been under the Mosaic Law. You're not under a tithe system. You've never been under a tithe system. If you want to give 10%, that's fine. That's if you purpose in your heart that you're going to give 10%. You can do that. But we give not grudgingly, or, you know, oh, whoops, excuse me, hit the wrong button. Uh, we give as a cheerful giver. Most of you know this. You've heard me say this. You know what the Greek word for cheerful is? It's hilarious. That's the Greek word, hilarious, for cheerful. And so God says, for us, you give as you purpose in your heart. Not grudgingly, not necessarily, but God loves a uh, Hilarious giver. We've got just a few minutes, so I want to give you three things quickly. Uh, So before the law, there were offerings, acts of worship. Under the law, tithes were required. That is not an act of worship. Offerings were an act of worship. And now after the law, all of us, we give as we purpose in our hearts as acts of worship to God. So quickly, I want you to see uh, three keys for giving. The how, the motive, and the results. And let's talk about the how for a second. Um, a lot of people don't understand how to give or what to do. The first thing is that it's called free will offerings. We just saw that. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, give, give cheerfully. The second thing is give regularly. It's planned and purpose. That means you decide and you plan what you're going to give. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, Paul told the church at Corinth that when they come together on the first day of the week, they set aside their offerings. 
This is the first day of the week. That's why we would say to you, if you like, you know, this is our time of giving. If you'd like to give, give. That's free will offerings. There's also the aspect, now this is the key, and this is my favorite one, is that you honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. It's called giving of the first fruits. That means that whenever you get whatever you're going to get, give away on the front end. What a lot of people do is they get stuff, they get their money, and they go, got this, yes, give, 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 gosh, there's none left. We'd like to give, but there's none left. The Bible says, give on the front end. When you get your money, you give away, and you're going to have to trust God as you go and spend all the rest of your stuff. You've got to trust him. That's what he talks about. And so uh, this is the, the plan, and this, this is the motive. Now, get this, remember? Here's the motive. You've seen it before. I'm going to go very quickly through it. A motive is it's an act of love. You give because you love God and you love others. Second Corinthians chapter 8 is, is, is beautiful because it basically says that. He says, you respond and to show your love as you give. And then the second thing, it's an act of worship. We saw it in Philippians. It's a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. The third thing is you got to trust God. 2 Corinthians 9, 10 says, the God who provides the way, uh, he, he's, it's his way of, of you trusting him and growing as a believer. That's what it is. Listen, whatever you give away, you're going to have to trust God that you're going to live just as good now on less than you would have. And let me just tell you something. And I've, I mean, I'm, I, could, I got a bunch of stories. I could tell them. God will always take care of you. And listen, if you had 100 and you gave away 20, you're going to live better on the 80 than you would have lived on, on the 100. God does it. He always does it. I've told you some stories last week or time before that about how God has always blessed me and always taken care of me. I just want to tell this one thing, and I'm going to tell you that when, and you've heard me say it, when I got ready to go to seminary, I had not ever given hardly any. I just didn't understand giving. Right before I got ready to go to seminary, I actually said, I'm going to study the Bible. I looked at it. I saw the principles for giving, I made a decision that whatever money I had from that point on, every time I got my money in, I would give a portion away. That was 40, 50 years ago. And let me tell you what, every if you came right now and said, here's your $100 bill, I would say, thank you so much. I'd immediately give some away. That's, I've done it for 50 years. I've never lacked a thing. I have more than I've ever had in my life. I can give away more than I've ever given away because every time I give something away, God gives me more, and I go, okay, I'll give some more of that away. It happens all the time. You have to trust him. The results of giving is blessing. Remember, that's not the motive, but it's the results. And as you give, God will bless you beyond what you could imagine, and, and that's not the motive, but that's the result. So what do we see? How do we give? We give free will and planned and purpose, and we give from the front end. The motive is love, worship, and trust. The ultimate result is blessing. So let me give you this. I know time is up. Let us realize the blessing connected with giving. Jesus said it is more what? Blessed to give than receive. Do you realize that when you give, you get the blessing? The, the giver gets blessed and the receiver gets blessed. It's amazing. You're not under a law system. Don't put yourself under law. Just remember that. Giving is it, it's more blessed to give than receive. Understand the principles, the biblical principles. I know most of you were taught to give a tenth. And yet, the average Christian in America gives less than 2%. They're all being taught to give 10 and they feel guilty because they're not giving 10%. They're giving 2%. If they give it all, you're not under a law. You're not under a Mosaic law. You've never been under a Mosaic law. You give as an act of worship, love, and trust. You give as you purpose in your heart, not grudgingly necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. So understand the biblical principles about giving so you can understand it. And then here's the last one. Let's make some decisions concerning giving. Uh, if you, maybe, maybe you've been coming to the church and you haven't given much or any. What? Start giving. And maybe you hadn't thought right now about what do you want to do about that building? Do you want to have a part in it? Look at these kids. Look at these youth right here. All the children are all back there. What do you want to do? How do you want to give? Do you want something to happen for that building? You need to think about it and say, Lord, let me, let me think about what I have, what I would like to give. Uh, I told this, I, I think, last week, and I may have told it in the first service, but I got, I got one of those cards early. I've had a card. 
And when they gave it to me, the guy that gave it to me, the guy that's the, the guy that you're going to meet, his name is Chuck, he's been here. He said, put down in your mind what you're planning to give and then what you would really like to give if you could. And so I sat down in my mind and I said, this is what, you know, this is what I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to give. And two Sundays ago, I was sitting right there, first service, Jean was, I don't think Jean was with me. She came to the second service that day, not that she skipped church, but she came to the second service. And as I was sitting there, but right before I got up to, to speak, I said, I'm going to give what I want to give, not what I planned. I'm going to give more. So listen, the longer you wait to plan, you're going to give more. So just take your time on what you want to give, think through it, and then, and then give, because it really does. So think about the, the building, the youth, the purpose, all of those things. 